there everyone and welcome to To Know the Last Days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mokalover, as we explore today the redeemed Black League. And it is located right here. Even amidst the post-imperial wasteland, the Black League has endured, protected by the distributed leadership created by Plan Hydra. In internal exile, the surviving leader of the Black League, Alexander Lazarenko, has developed a new thesis, one that implements the lessons learned against the region to the great trial, according to Lazarenko. It was not against the Germans, but against fellow Russians. The Black League can trust nobody. Not even fellow Russians. Lazarenko's redeemed Black League will be a state formed of the purest, untainted by the foolish notion of a shared Russian heritage. Only those born under the Black League auspices are subject to the strictest regimentation are pure and worthy. All others are to be considered existential threats and either expelled or dealt with in other ways. And of course we are led by... Wow, look at that manpower. Wow. Alexander Lazarenko. Very cool. Broken into shape. Victor's road towards the first reformed redemptionary brigade has been long and painful within the chaos of the Russian anarchy. He had shaped himself into a thief, stealing whatever he needed to survive from those too weak to protect their possessions. As a shadow of Daddy Tabby's regime stretched across Russia, he was imprisoned and sentenced to die. He thought his luck was shifting when the redeemed Black League sprung him from prison during the chaos of the Regency's collapse. However, looking at what was supposed to be his training camp, he knew that thought to be foolish. He recognized the people around him. They were fellow prisoners he knew from his time behind bars, murderers and thieves. They were surrounded by towering steel walls with faceless guards manning the battlements, staring right through each and every recruit, waiting for them to step even an inch out of the line. Their barracks was a crowded tent filled with lumpy beds that lacked pillows or blankets. There was no place for any of them to store personal possessions or even spare sets of clothes. They were expected to wear the one uniform they were granted at all times, a constant reminder of who they were supposed to be. There was not enough of anything to go around, not enough equipment, not enough beds or food. They were expected to fight for their right to live or for their redemption that they were offered from this new Black League. So that is what they did. Each and every recruit fought for every scrap of food they could while the masked guards in the walls watched them assessing them all. As time went on, they were privileged to be visited by a small team of drill sergeants. These men would begin the arduous process of taming the wild animals that they had created. Week by week, drill by drill, the recruits were trained once when Victor beat another recruit in a fight. He was awarded with additional serving of food, and the loser sent into solitary confinement without food. These animals will learn. And of course, we have the National Spirits Insular Enclave. Hurts among the population, but that attack is very nice. And Redemptionary Service. Very nice. And Assaulted Earth. Mmm, tasty. A nation of iron. Alexander Lazarenko had pored over maps of the Black League's territory, searching for the most defendable positions. If the Black League was to survive this great trial and prevail against the masses of barbaric warlords, then they must forge a nation of iron, one that will not bend or break to the invading hordes. To achieve this, he and his staff has put together the Militarized Village Program, an initiative to concentrate the Black League's population into easy-to-defend strongholds and fortify them to withstand enemy incursion. He and the rest of the Black League knew that these people would resist being relocated, weakened by sentimentally, se sentimentality and a poorly placed pride in their heritage. This mattered not to Lazarenko or his staff. These people were not true members of the Black League. Instead, they were mere pawns to be used in the furthering of the Black League's interests. They would be relocated to at gunpoint, regardless of the wishes. Anyone who resisted would be shot without warning. Concentrating everyone into these strongholds also possessed another upside for the Black League. These peasants would be easy to survey and control under the watchful eye of the Black League. Lazarenko could even make sure that these peasants serve their purpose in the Great Trial. They would provide their labor, their minds, their possessions, and of course their lives, all in an effort towards the League's greater goal. It was the duty of Lazarenko and the redeemed Black League to save Russia from itself. The reason she had failed in all the prior trials was due to her unruly and savage people. Yevzov's great failing was his inability to see this immutable truth. And this new league will raise generations of true Russians. Russians that will give anything, including their life, for the Black League. Look at all the divisions uh, this you know, nation is making. And we'll just go and grab them. Uh, Strellas, because we can. Very nice. No draft exemptions. Very good. And slavery is not allowed? What? For ultra-nationalists and open immigration? Oh. Natural selection. Victor had lost track of how long he'd been at this training camp for the first reformed redemptionary brigade. The days had all melted together in a sort of a haze. Corpses had begun to gather all around the camps, with more piling up every single day. At first, the stench had been unbearable for him and the rest of the recruits, but after a while, their noses had gotten numb to it. Some of them starved to death, unable to fight for the right to eat. Others had died from disease due to the increasingly filthy nature of the camp. 
The rest had been killed, either by the guards or their fellow recruits. Those who remained had changed from their time spent within the camp. They become more violent, acting almost like rabid beasts rather than human beings. Altercations over food or equipment escalated from fistfights into brutal life or death combat. Everybody fought like they like their life depended on it, because they all knew that it did. In this place, Victor had no friends, just rivals for survival. Once a week, members of the Black League visited to check up on the progress of the recruits and to provide combat training. These were the only men the recruits truly feared. Anything that could be considered a slight towards a ranking officer was punished severely. A week in solitary for minor offenses and death for major offenses. Like rabid dogs wearing shock collars, the only thing these recruits truly feared was their masters. During his time at a camp, Victor learned every way he could possibly kill a person through instruction from the Black League and his own personal experience fighting for his life. He had been made into a skilled killer. Only the strong could survive the Black League's recruitment process, and Victor refused to die here, no matter the cost. Animals shaped into weapons. Hmm, minimal safety regulations. Outlawed, women in the workplace, equal rights. Hmm. Illegal child labor, what type of place is this? But the land of tears, my friends. Life in Svedlosk these days was terrible. Living under the military regime hadn't been sunshine and rainbows, but they had made the most of the situation, and the people of the city appreciated them for that. The imperial government, however, had been far, far worse. Citizens forced out of their homes, people shot in the streets, the violence was as limitless as it was senseless. They were not living under the imperial government anymore, though, for the Black League had returned. Although they wrapped themselves in the imagery and style of the old Black League, this new league was very different. Their sworn enemy was no longer the Germanic Teutons, and said they found their enemy in the very people of Russia. They blamed their fellow Russians for their failures to defeat Germany, time and time again. The result was a regime that did not even see their citizens as people. Instead, they were resources to use in raising future generations of Black League zealots. The streets of Svedlos were lined with men of the Internal Security Directorate. Their faces were covered with gas masks, and their arms carrying assault rifles. They watched the city's residents, punishing even the most minor of transgressions with extreme cruelty. At night, the men of the ISD raid the homes of everyday citizens, taking any form of personal possessions forbidden by the Black League. Harmless trinkets like comic books and children's toys were stolen and destroyed like cattle. The people of Sverdlos were kept alive only to carry out their uses to the Black League and nothing more. A city of suffering in which... Society of is improving quite a bit. Academic base, research facilities, not agriculture, poverty is getting worse, but better industrial ex expertise and equipment, and army professionalism. Not bad. Oh. oh, very good, very good. And bloody murder. Katarina was awoken from her sleep by the sounds of gunshots and screaming. She rushed to her window to see what was happening. The Black League had arrived in her village here to cleanse the population. She heard tales of the Black League raiding villages far from the new HQ in Sverdlosk, but she never imagined she would cross paths with them. Her thoughts were interrupted as a stray bullet emerged from her window, grazing her shoulder. Backing away from the window, she knew she had to escape. Rushing to a small shack near her house, another stray bullet grazed her leg. It took all of her willpower to not draw attention to herself by screaming. These soldiers fought more like rabid animals than human beings. Their rifles were all mismatched, affixed with sharpened scraps of metal to serve as makeshift bayonets. As they ran out of ammo in their weapons, rather than reload, most of them just dropped their weapons and began to kill people with their own hands or knives. The men of the Black League spared nobody, not even the children. The brutality they unleashed upon the small village was most, almost puzzling. Katarina had seen her village suffer many raids, many times before, but... Those men were sadistic. They engaged in cruelty for their own enjoyment. These men, however, did not seem to enjoy any of the horrors they were unleashing upon her people. In fact, in the brief glimpses she got of their faces, they didn't seem to feel anything at all. They showed no... Uh, they showed zero emotion, as they mercilessly slaughtered this village. Not enjoyment nor regret, nor pleasure nor pain. It was as if they were not even present anymore. Still, in the small shack and fearing for her life, Katarina waited for all the soldiers around her to be occupied. It pained her to use the suffering and deaths of the people she once thought of as friends to escape, to escape this. But she had no other option. When she thought an opportunity presented itself, she bolted from the shack heading east. Unfortunately for her... Someone had taken notice. She tried to run as fast as she could, but her leg was still bleeding. It didn't take long for the man behind her to catch up. The animals finally unleashed. And it looks like we're about halfway through the Warlords after Daddy Tabby's Little Empire. But if you enjoyed this video, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already. And I'll see you tomorrow in another video. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.